So we're in the post-resurrection appearances. In this Eastertide season. And I'll begin in verse 1 of chapter 21. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? And they answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it. And now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved, therefore, said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and he threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. And I'll stop there. So once again, Jesus is revealing himself as if he needs to, but apparently he does because of hard-hearted disciples and their stubbornness. It's not just happenstance that they're at the Sea of Galilee, really. Same as Tiberias, where they were first called. Because it was time for one last call. And, and actually, in, in this account, this is the last time that Jesus will say the words, follow me. To his disciples. But John only mentions seven of them. Seven. What happened to the twelve? And it's not a random coincidence. Um, it was either a, yeah, a, a spacecraft or, or a lawnmower, I don't know. Or a motorcycle, probably. Hebrew, Hebrew um, symbolism that we don't think too, uh, think too much of as American Christians speaking English. We count, we count one, two, three, four. I got four cough drops right here, just in case. I get dry and start coughing in front of you and my gallon ridiculous non-Stanley cup uh, isn't, you know, because I don't want you to judge me. No. Um. We, we count like this. So Hebrew, Jewish counting is, it's, it's not so much the numbers, it's, it's, it's a weight in the symbols. So we have that seven, that um, the, the meaning, it's more about the meaning when we hear the numbers. And the number seven, it's got a lot of meaning, right? Completion, God's work among his people. If you read the entire book of John, you'll see that he starts with the first, the seven days of Jesus' ministry from John the Baptist calling and then um, the wedding, wedding at Cana, the seven signs, the seven I am statements. In, in the book, in John's book of Revelation of Visions, the, the word seven is used actually 49 times, so seven times seven, for individual, like, specific occurrences um, where it's not repeated saying the same thing. So it's 49 times. It's not by chance. But why seven disciples here? And why these seven? or these five and the two with no names. Let's look at their history. Because they're really not that special if you think about it. Peter, he claimed he would follow Jesus anywhere. 
and tried to fight for Jesus with, he's so bold, he's going to cut off people's ears for the cause. Yet he denies Jesus publicly three times. Thomas, the doubter, demanded proof rather than taking him at his word. Nathaniel, what did Nathaniel say? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? <laughs> Referring to Jesus. And how about, probably my favorite, I guess, four and five, the sons of Zebedee. James and John raised in hatred to, I mean, hate anybody who's not a pure-blooded ethnic Jew because when the mixed race comes, the Samaritans, they ask, they ask Jesus if they can call fire down from heaven to smite them and kill them. And on top of that, they wanted to be next to Jesus on the throne, right? Because they were expecting him to set up his earthly throne right there. And then the mom later on, you don't see her because she realizes, she also asked too, she realizes, oh, I was asking actually for them to be on the cross with him. So um, that's the first five. The last two, we have no names. They're just unknowns, just nobodies. So these were not model disciples or pastors or leaders of the, the, the church that was going to be established. Faithless, arrogant, racist, yeah, stubborn, violent, doubters. And then you, you have just two we don't even know about. And this is who's called to carry on the Great Commission. What is God thinking, right? Picking people like this. That's what they thought. That's what the Jews thought. I think we think that too sometimes. Well, <clears throat> the reason was is, is there's a, a work that's being completed, and that's where that number seven comes in. From the first call to the, to the last call, which is a continual call, I'd say, God starts a work in us. When you give your life, when you choose to follow him, and you make that commitment, and God, the amazing thing about him, unlike us, he finishes what he starts. He's been doing it since Genesis 2. Seventh day, right? Philippians 1.6, and I am convinced and sure of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will continue until the day of Jesus Christ right up to the time of his return in the Amplified, developing that good work and perfecting and bringing it to full completion in you. And it's not just waiting for his final coming. It is... It's for another reason, and that's that the man or woman of God would be made complete. And 2 Timothy 3.17 says, equipped for every good work. So he started a work in you to do a work, to produce something out of your life. He begins a work in us so we can continue. And we're continuing his works among men. And women. So that means that we're actually participating in his work among his new creation because we're a new creation in Christ. So when we follow him with our whole lives, we get to participate in the new work he's doing in other people. We're participating in a new creation. I mean, that's amazing to me. And I don't think we realize that all the time when this just becomes a religion or a church thing or a, a something supplemental to your life. And, and when, those, when that moment happens, when you're maybe dissatisfied or distract, distracted from your, you know, where you came from and why you got into this, why you committed to Jesus, especially when things are hard, God will take us back to the beginning. He'll take us back to bring us to maturity and Sometimes that feels like a spiritual deja vu. In verse 7, 
verse 7, and that's not, John didn't put the verse 7 number in there, so um, that came after. John, but he, John, John recognizes who the man on the shore was, uh, the beloved disciple. He's, he's, he felt like they, have we been in this situation before? I, I think so. We're at the Sea of Galilee. We're fishing. Same lake being provided for by a man they don't really fully recognize, he knows it's Jesus. I, I know what this is. And Peter, of course, he's going to be the first to run out there. A hundred yards, which isn't very long. <laughs> Threw himself into the sea. He's not messing around. And when they get to the land, what do they see? A charcoal fire. It's all coming together now. Fish laid on it, bread. Verse 10, Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, fish 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared ask asked him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and, and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Only two places in the New Testament where the word charcoal is found. John 18, 18 and 21, 9. So this is the charcoal fire is the bridge back to the night that Peter denied Jesus. Something is going to happen. It was a cold, dark night, and here they are on a much warmer sunrise. About to be restored. Verse 15, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved. Because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. So in the English, he's asking three times if Peter loves him. Three times, take care of my sheep. And there's, there are subtle variations in the Greek, and I, I've even taught off that before, uh, used in, in, in preaching. But in actuality, it is more poetry than it is a progression of love. So what I'm saying is there's not actually a deeper separate meaning for each one. Like that Peter is only saying he loves him a certain amount on that part, and then on the next part, he loves him a different way. And sometimes going too far, we can miss the forest for the trees. Because you have both words for friendship and divine love, and in the gospel, if, this is why reading in context is important, even if you're going to do a Greek study, in the gospel of John, those words are used interchangeably. Both verbs are used to speak of the disciple whom Jesus loved, the agape and the philo. God's love for the disciples and the disciples' love for Jesus. And that's in 520, 1423, 1017, 1627. So there's no reason to make these have necessarily higher or lower levels of meanings. It's, it's just, it's love. It's including friendship and it's including divine love. It's also a love that included both feeding, meaning like instructing the sheep, and tending to them, meaning caring for them. 
It's not an either or thing. And then, of course, the sheep versus the lambs, whether it's a young sheep or an old, I guess, lamb. So this was one of the last leadership tests of love for Peter before Pentecost. And the church, the point is, versus all these different love scenarios, is that the church had to require a first um, leader who completely loved Jesus and was ready to take care of the people of God. And that is a love that is continually tested and refined. Not, not just to receive provision, because we, Jesus is he's, he's always taking care of people, right? He's always feeding, instructing, giving. He just fed them again. But they have to feed others now because he know, he's going away. He provides for us so that we can provide for others. That's how this works in the church. Not, and this is, a, this is a leadership message, and it's also a, a church-wide message. And you'll understand that by the end. Lives of service for everyone, especially leaders. So this was a call for Peter or pastors not to have um, positions of power or influence in that, in, in this, unless it's being influenced for the kingdom, right? Unless it's pointing back to Jesus. It, it was never about that. It was always, always the call to, to be in leadership in a church was always to serve people. Always to serve people. Because whose people are we anyway? He says it right there. He doesn't say, hey, feed your sheep, Peter. No. He says, mine. In fact, that's more important than, that, than finding out the Greek on the, on the love and all that. This is God's people. He says, take care of my people, my sheep, not yours, Peter. Take care of them because they're the Lord's. Go fishing, yeah, get fish because the Lord has use for them. Feed people with God's word, loving people and caring for them and in a community, loving the broken, the ones hurt by, by the world and by religion. Spending time with the sick. I... I know this is, you know, we're in a small town, a small church. I, sometimes I have people ask me, you know, why do you, why do you spend so much time, you know, visiting with people and stuff? <laughs> the worst is when I have pastors ask me that. I'm a, are you serious? This is, this is what it's, did you see what Jesus did? Isn't that what he commanded us to do? It's the heart of a shepherd because it's the heart of Jesus. And I really question. Uh, I question. I question what church leadership has become in a lot of places. Even from examples given so much respect and having really big followings. You know, leadership in the limelight. Because there, are, there, there is leadership, a model of church leadership that can do so much damage in the church. The Bible says, who are treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. I'm using that in, in uh, Timothy uh, 3, 4 to apply to a bad style of leadership. Because Jesus only modeled one leadership style. And it's the servant one. Not a ruling one. 
He didn't call Peter, Peter to rule over people, like to lord things over them. Or Actually, he didn't, call, he didn't call Peter to even start a denomination. Didn't. He called him to care for God's people. That's a huge responsibility. And love them into the kingdom and serve them into the kingdom. And then that same calling that Peter has, it's not just for leaders, it's, it's for all of us. But the church can become more about the number of fish caught, more than the one who provided the fish in the first place. Who provided those fish for them? Jesus did. Even if it wasn't some big, huge, miraculous thing, he still would have because he created everything. He created, and he's the one who draws people's hearts into the kingdom so that we can't take credit for it. And this is when the boast in churches is more in the attendance and the numbers and the success. And yeah, that temptation, you bet I've had that temptation. Everybody does. And also within the church. Saying, look what the Lord has done. Rather than, look, it's the Lord. Who did it? Wouldn't it be arrogant for the disciples to say, hey, 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 look at these 153 fish that we caught. That we caught, right? Look how successful our ministry is becoming. Now, most every scholar that you'll read, they can't figure out the 153 number. They can't. They don't, and it could just be that it's just a random number. Not every number has to have some crazy deep meaning, right? So here's my theory. John put it in there just for that purpose. My theory is because the number of the fish really doesn't matter. Because Jesus is the one who drew them in, and he is, he is the one who actually does the counting, not us. He's the one who does that. He sees hearts, and we can easily count salvation cards and make it our trophy for a successful ministry. We can do that. But the focus always has to be on Jesus and then him working those people into completion that he drew in. But when our eyes get off the Lord, we tend to follow men. And that's heavy. Jesus was preparing Peter for a time when he would start, help start these early churches, and it grew fast. I mean, you, it, you imagine a thousand people which can't even fit in the sanctuary? Wow, what's going on there? What is that pastor doing that's so special? Right there, you lost it. What? What is God doing? So Jesus is preparing him for this because he already sees ahead. And, uh, so that he wouldn't get big-headed and lead in this, what he had was this more of an authoritative, arrogant way. You know, more of a competitive way. And you even see after this account, he gets a little competitive. That's the way the religious leaders acted. And also, that's what the Gentile political rulers were acting like. They were, had this ruling mentality. Why in the world would that ever be the, the, the model of leadership for the church? I don't get it. Now, you'll find this in all in, in church history, and I've heard of it before. I got a better grasp on it this morning, I guess. There was something called the shepherding movement. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Weirdly enough, it was called the discipleship movement. Uh, basically, it's a, you can look it up later, but it's a, pyra- a, a pyramid of submission where you have one person on top and they like have to submit to their authority. And it's where we get the term spiritual covering, which I've used before. It's actually not even in the Bible or the concept of it. You know, you have to... Um, you have to ask that one person for basically permission to do anything. 
I, right there, it already sounds like a cult to me. It sounds scary. Now, Derek Prince, he denounced that and left because he was involved in it and some others. But, but they're still out there, and it's absolutely crazy. They say that you cannot lead anyone where you haven't gone, but in, in this time that we've been in for a while, we see leaders going to places that Jesus would never go. And I'm talking about leaders in the church, and that's places of prosperity, of power, of almost dictatorship. And you know what that does for the church as a whole? It hurts the body. It hurts the body of Christ because that's not why we were called. That's not why the church was called, to elevate man and make our pulpits and altars some kind of stage show. It kind of sounds like what James and John wanted, if you think about it, because in Mark 10, 35, the sons of Zebedee came to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. <laughs> wow, I'm sorry I laughed. That's just crazy to me. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? Like, haven't I done enough? Do you know what I'm about to do? And they said to him, Grant us to sit one in your right hand and one on your left in your glory. Wow. Then Jesus said, in uh, 1042, he called them to him and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. So the, the word for ruler in the Bible is never, ever used for a pastor, an apostle, an evangelist, a missionary, Ever. The only time that word ruler is used for, it's, it's basically for four kingdoms. The first one is the religious leaders who rule authority over people like that. The second one is for political leaders who rule their authority over people just like that. The third one is the ruler that they, we call the prince of the power of the air. And that's Satan and his principalities and powers and all that stuff. There is only one ruler that is used in the context of the good, and that's Jesus Christ. Amen. Because he's the supreme ruler. Revelation 4, uh, 1, 4 through 5, John to the seven churches that are in Asia. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of kings on earth. Church leaders always are called to be servants. And I mean, servants to each other too. And we see that servants of the Most High in Acts 16, 17, servants of God, servants of man. There's no ruling there. There's no dictatorship there. It's incompatible from what we're called to do. And that's from the highest denominational influencers to the missionaries that are overseas to the small town Iowa preachers with 25 likes on Facebook. Lording over people authoritatively in ministries. This is how it's answered by Jesus himself. Verse 43 of Mark 10. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And give his life a ransom for many. So he's saying become slave of all. You want to be a, you want to be a pastor? You want to be a leader? Which basically means servant if you get down to the minister word. Are you willing to lay down your life? for other people to serve and love one another and build up the body before you build up a following and a name for yourself.
And this Western church thing, I had somebody tell me the other day, you know, I'm just leaving this whole Western church thing and uh, I just don't, I'm not down with it anymore. I'm going to go do my own thing. And I'm like, oh. And you know, it grieved my heart right away, but I'm thinking, I can see why. I get it. I understand. But if we get back to the Bible, yeah. we can get back to changing that. Competing with each other. Competing with each other in churches. Often, and, and they want us to plant so many, let's just plant churches, plant churches. It's, it, Competing for the biggest catch sometimes. I'm not coming against all church planning, of course, but competing for the number of fish. Who can get the most? By obtaining people that are actually Jesus's anyway, not ours. He called us to care for his people. To love one another more than our own lives. So what, what came out of this threefold restoration for Peter Guess what? It, it wasn't. It was not a, like the Apostle Peter Church with his name in lights. And for sure, I'm just going to guess, but if Peter saw like a cathedral and his name honoring him as a saint, he'd probably be like, what are, what, are, you, are you serious? Do you know what he taught me? Because if you read it, he called me to be a servant. He actually called him to a death that glorifies God. Verse 18 says, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. Verse 19, this he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him for the last time, follow me. And that's what he did. Tradition tells us, history tells us, that Peter was crucified upside down by Nero. If you don't know, I don't know if there's kids here, Nero was a sick dude. Okay, I don't even want to, it's like, it's R-rated if I were to tell you what he did. You can research it later. And trust me, it was his pleasure to see Peter crucified upside down. But it was Peter's pleasure to, pleasure to serve the Lord like that. Because he didn't even want to be close to a cross right side up that he would ever be looked at like that. So, perhaps this is what revival looks like. People who are willing to lay down their lives. And that, my friends, is a picture of church leadership for you this morning. That is a picture of successful ministry. Not to have packed houses with incredible buildings. But pastor, the bigger our building, the more people are coming in. And, and yeah, I understand that. I, I, know, I know what you're saying. But the purpose is to be a people who really have returned back to where Jesus first called them to. That, that place, that moment. And, and the Lord will take us back there. He does with me frequently. And I thank God for that. You know, God forbid that I ever stand here and say, hey guys, yeah, you know, I used to be a drug addict, but no, you know, I used to be on the streets. What? I don't ever want to do that. I want to be reminded because I remember when he first called me. It helps me remember why, the why of why we're here. Every church, not just this church, not just Assemblies of God or Baptist or anything. This is every church, every church body to be tested and asked, do we really love him? Do we really love him? So we can answer and say, yeah, Lord, you know that I love you. You know I do. The church has to return in these last days, right? To remembering their first call. Remember when you said yes. 
When you said, yeah, Lord, I'll follow you. Maybe it was in a service. Actually, maybe it wasn't in a service. Out on the street, somebody talked to you. You picked up your Bible. You picked up one of those little tiny Bibles on the road that somebody threw away. You never know. God can speak through his word. And you said, Lord, I'm, I'm following you. And, and, you know, Jesus saw your ambition. He saw your heart, maybe kind of like Peter's or Simon Peter's. And he, he saw your potential, like he still sees it. And just like Simon, he had to grow into becoming Peter. That's that complete work that he's establishing and continuing to build and, and grow in all of us. But his old name keeps coming up. Simon, why are you calling me Simon? I'm Peter now, right? It's a reminder. It's a reminder of identity because there's an identity change. I mean, it's a new creation, but in, in reality, in heaven, Jesus Christ, for us, it's, it, it's called a new name that he already knows. And it's a new name for us to grow into. It's an identity for us to grow into. He knows exactly how you are now, and he knows how you are in heaven, in the future. Wow, that's crazy, right? Yeah, he already knows. And he has a new name for you stored up in heaven. Revelation 2.17, it's really stored up in his heart. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, because he loves to provide for us. We'll give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives us, uh, receives it. So now, you know, I think that Simon kind of got a taste of his new name in heaven. I, I, I think that's a taste of the identity of Peter that Jesus was calling him to be. And that's how the church was founded. Because he was willing to grow into that. And later on, you still see the new and the old, the new and the old, you know, back and forth, back and forth. And finally, in, in, in glory, it's just, no, this, this is who you are. But that's who we're on our way, our way to be. And is that what we're willing to do? is to grow into that new identity. I'd say we all have growing to do before we receive our names. I don't know what it's going to be. Um, I have no idea. But God already knows. He already sees your, the work that's completed in you before it even happens. And he's requiring of us that we return. And he's saying to the church right now, do, do, you guys, do you guys love me? Like, do you love me? Yeah, Lord, we love you. Look, look, look. I mean, haven't you seen our building? Have you seen what we're doing, what we're doing, what we're doing, what we're, we're doing it for you, Lord? No, he's saying, do you love me? If that's the case, become least of all. Become a slave to other people. Take care of the people of God. Don't, don't, leave your, don't leave your church just for crazy reasons that don't make any sense. This is God's people. We can't break it up. We're supposed to be serving one another. The last call for Peter is still being heard to the church and its leaders worldwide. And it's really, do you love me? Think back today when he first called you? Where were you? Why did, why, did you, why did you do this? Why did you follow him? In, in, in the Revelation churches, um, in the letters, you know, it, it's clear that they lost something. That's a warning for us. That we're supposed to return to that first call so that we could step into who he created us to be. So this morning, would you stand just for a moment as we're just going to worship? No, um, no, uh, I mean, you can come to the altar and pray if you need to and all that, but here's, here's what we have to do kind of like together because we're a body, right? You know, we're his people. Do you know that this isn't special?
I know, Pastor, but you got to respect those in leadership. Yeah, I, I, I believe that. I, I agree with that if it's biblically. But I'm, I'm, just a, I'm just a sheep and a lamb too, right? Aren't we all? I was just a fish in a net too. Aren't we all? I'm just someone going from an old name to a new name. Aren't we all? Aren't we all supposed to be serving one another and slaves to one another and loving one another? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And how do, how do we remember that again? Well, go back and remember who, who you were without him. It's pretty simple. And let your worship flow out of that this morning. Thankfulness, gratefulness for who he called you to be. And we're just going to seek after him. And ask the Lord, Lord, teach me, teach me about what that new name looks like in heaven. That's what I'm asking him. I want to be closer to that. It's like Simon being closer to Peter because he didn't want to be called Simon. Trust me. He wanted to be called Peter. And we have that opportunity this morning. But first, would you close your eyes? Man. There are some in here who have no, absolutely no moment in their lives where they can look back to and say, yeah, that's the moment that I chose to follow you, Lord. Without any manipulation, if that's a moment that's lost for you this morning, you can't pinpoint it, you don't know Maybe it was a half moment for you. And this morning you're like, I want a new name. Well, uh, yeah, that sounds good to me because my identity is shot right now. I don't even know who I am. That's because you're lost. And you know what? It's okay. Because he's drawing you in like he drew in fish into a net. Because he loves you so much. And yeah, you know what? He uses the church to do that. To represent him. If that's you today with every head bowed and every eye closed and you're just telling me from one fish to another, I'm going to follow him today. Would you raise your hand this morning? Just slip your hand up. All right, all right, all right. All right, fish, put your hands down. You've been caught with a great price and he desires you today. He has a new identity and purpose for you. Guess what? We're not counting those hands. I'm going to go against what training tells me to do, right? Because Jesus has you counted and numbered. He measured you. Before the foundations of the earth, he marked you. And you're stepping into that. So make this that, that, that day, that marker in your life, a memorial, which is absolutely biblical. This is the day that I followed him. And I jumped in the water, and I'm not looking back. It's my last call. And for those of us who have already done it, you just revisit it over and over again until your heart is so burning with passion for the lost and the people in the church, even the ones who you sometimes really get bothered by. And that love just builds in you, and we're all doing what we were called to be. Let's worship this morning and thank him for his goodness.